So welcome everyone and thank you very much uh, for joining us during this fifth edition of the Meet a Method um, series of panels. Uh, so as some of you, I see familiar faces, familiar names from previous editions. Um, as you, as some of you, you know, this is a series of panels where each panel focuses on one particular method. Uh, and we, we typically follow a structure where we have first the what, so what the method is about, what are what are the some of the most common applications uh, and some of really a, a general introduction to the method? Uh, then the how, where we get slightly more involved with with an idea of introducing an application uh, of a method to a particular research question. It could be a series of uh, series of papers or series of projects. And then we finally go to the to the do's and don'ts, the common most common pit, pitfalls, and really. What are the what are the real do's and what are the real don'ts when you consider um, using a partic particular method in your research? Uh, so this time we have uh, three wonderful panelists who are really great experts on the topic. We're we're very uh, very very fortunate to have them, and thank you for joining us. Uh, so Regan Regan, sorry, will uh, will be talking. Will be starting, and he will be talking about the what. Uh, then Giada will be talking about the how. And Oliver finally about the do's and don'ts. Each panelist will have uh, 20 minutes. And what I suggest is uh, that we somehow keep the Q&A uh, session for after the, the final uh, final presentation by Oliver, because as, as you might have questions, some of them may actually be answered uh, by the next uh, by the next panelist. Uh, please feel free to use the chat in the meantime to uh, some oppose all your questions, comments. Uh, I will keep uh, track of them. So my role be, will be fully as a moderator. So I will open up the, I'll try to aggregate those questions that you may have. And then when time comes for the Q&A session, uh, I may somehow start by asking the panelists about the most commonly um, asked questions that, that came during, uh, during the session in the chat. And then we'll open it up for general Q&A. So at that time, please feel free to speak up. Uh, please feel free to engage. The idea is also to make it as engaging and interactive as possible. So I'll not take any more time, and uh, without further ado, I'll 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 give it uh, give it over to Regan. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so let's see if I can get the screen share going here. I think you might have to unshare yours. There we go. All set. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, it's I'm really excited to talk about this this uh, this topic. This is a topic that I have a lot of fun talking about. Um, this is where I spend a lot of my time uh, doing my research now and, and working with doc students. And um, just a little bit about myself. I'm at Indiana University. Uh, I've been at Indiana for six years now, and I've been running lab experiments for about ten years. So when I started my doc program. Um, I found lab experiments to be something that I found to be really interesting. Uh, a lot of the time I look at entrepreneurial context, so decision making. So it's there's strategy implications, but sometimes it's more at the entrepreneurial level. So today when I go over this and kind of a real quick overview of, of you know, what is a lab research, there might be some of my bias toward uh, entrepreneurship, but you know, I've, I've identified um, opportunities for strategy researchers that I'll talk about here as well. So so let's get into the topic. Uh, basically, here's the overview of the agenda, what we're going to go through today. Okay, so first, I'm going to talk about the uh, the what, so the introduction to uh, a lab experiment. Specifically, we'll hit on what do we actually mean by lab experiment? That could be kind of a loaded term as it relates to strategy research. Um, what, uh, what, what do we mean by experiments in strategy? What's been done so far? Kind of what's the status quo? Uh, I'll cover that really briefly. Um, why and when could you conduct an experiment? A really quick overview that I'll mention on experimental design, and I assume that um, my, my co-panelists will probably pick up that topic after. Uh, and then uh, some opportunities that, that come out of a, a review document or review piece that we've published recently, so I can share that with you as well. And then, as I mentioned, co-panelists will pick up on the how and, and the, the do's and don'ts here. So. All right, so we probably already know, we're probably already pretty familiar with the fact that experiments and strategy research are underutilized. So it's, it's a methodology that's not as common as, as typical methodologies. And so this has been echoed in the literature for at least a decade now. 
And wanting to know a little bit more about the, the status quo, some co-authors and I, we conducted a review uh, last year that was published in 2020 in, in a JOM review article. And what we what we did was we tried to survey and try to um, try to identify all of the experiments that were done in strategy, both lab experiments and field studies. And so we kind of followed the you know best practice review review practices, and we identified through keywords and the top journals uh, articles. We obviously excluded um, you know articles that had the word experiment and, and lab and other things outside of the methodology, so the context itself, and um, we found uh, 179 studies over a 20 year period that were published. So that's, it might seem like a large number, you might be unfamiliar with that, but um, by comparison, if I, what I did this morning is I went to Google Scholar and I looked up uh, one of the psychologists who I like to follow and read her work. And she had over that same period, um, 20, uh, or, sorry, 250 studies over that same 20 year period. So one researcher, pretty prolific, obviously, uh, compared to our entire field with 179. So what that signals to me is there's huge opportunity here uh, for, for us to consider labs, lab experiments as, as a viable methodology. And the good news is that it is growing. So if you look at this, this uh, chart over time here, you see that strategic management lab experiments are growing. 2020, uh, 2019 was a little bit of an outlier, um, but still the upward trajectory. Same with uh, entrepreneurship context as well. So uh, we're on the right path, I would, I would say. So what do we actually mean when we say lab experiment? Well, you're probably familiar with kind of a natural experiment context where randomization occurs in the field. Um, it's not under the experimenter's control and there's observable randomization that occurs. Um, so we're more familiar with that. Then of course we have field experiments and this is, this is taken off in strategy a little bit more as well, where the researcher will go into a context and try to manipulate or create an intervention in which it can be adopted by certain divisions in the company, um, maybe, uh, maybe different companies uh, and, and do a cross-company comparison. But when, with lab experiments, what we're really talking about here is the idea that you would play a very active role in manipulating all of the variables of interest. So you're trying to reduce the complexity of, of the situation, which obviously in the strategy context, there's, there's a lot of complexity, there's a lot of alternative explanations that are taking place. So in a lab experiment, the researcher plays an active role in manipulating the variables of interest. So you really are thinking about every variable that could be a predictor as something that's entirely under the researcher's control, right? As opposed to a field study where you might have some vignette, you may have some intervention, but you're still gonna measure a lot of differences between groups, okay? So that's the kind of the key differentiator, at least the way I see it between a lab experiment and a field study. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it takes place physically in a lab, right? It could take place in a boardroom. It could take place in a classroom. It could take place in another setting. But the idea here principally is that you are trying to control every variable of interest, okay? So, you do that, of course, through randomization. You, you're, putting, you're putting participants into different groups and at least theoretically, all of the you know, within-person differences are, are going to be randomized into these groups. So in theory, you shouldn't need to have control variables in your model, okay? I will say with certainty, if you try to publish a, a lab experiment, you will get asked by reviewers for control variables. The purest psychologist experimentalist would say, that is unnecessary because of randomization. But you know, as a strategy or entrepreneurship researcher, you really need to be thinking about at least capturing some of those variables, probably running the model with controls and without control variables or other variables in your model when you go to publish the paper. But ideally, um, you know, the, 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 the point here is that between groups, all of these other variables that you aren't directly controlling should be equalized or controlled through the design. All right, and one other thing that's really important about a lab study is, you know, right on the right up front, you have to understand that this is an artificial setting by design. So you've made a choice not to go into the field. You've made a choice not to look at archival data. And as a result, there is gonna be some level of artificiality to this design, no matter what you do. So if a reviewer challenges you, or, you know, if, you're, if your ideal is to think about this as being like a, a complete simulation of the real world, 
you're probably never going to hit that standard, right? There's always some level of artificial artificiality here. The goal for the researcher is to try to find some reasonable level of, of a realistic scenario with ecological validity. So the behaviors simulate the real world scenario. And um, we can dig into that a little bit about how you would go about trying to trying to get there. So that's a little bit of an overview of you know, what's what a lab experiment is and how it different differs from a field study um, and from you know classic observational studies. So why would you want to con conduct an experiment? So the main reason, obviously, in strategy research, we are trying to identify antecedents of firm performance, and so we're trying to find you know, isolate cause and effect. And uh, you know, lab experiments are essentially the gold standard for looking at cause and effect because of the temporal precedence that takes place of when you manipulate a variable and what you observe in the outcome. So that's one of the core reasons. And the other reason is you want, you're dealing with a complex question and you want to hold constant all these alternative explanations. So those are the, the primary reasons why you'd think about using an experiment in your research. So they're ideal, they tend to be ideal uh, in a lot of different scenarios where they actually might be even a better methodology than, you know, kind of a standard way of, of approaching a, a strategy research question. So if you want to understand a psychological me mechanism or a cognitive process that underlies the observable variables that you see in the field, this could be an approach that you could take, right? So you, you really want to look at that mediation effect. You can see the observations taking place in the field, but you have a theory or a hunch or a hypothesis as to what, what's happening uh, in the minds of the participants. Well, perhaps you couple a experiment, a lab experiment with a field study, and you try to go a little deeper into that mechanism. So that's, that's an ideal time, at least in my opinion, when you'd want to use a psychology or when you'd want to use a lab experiment. So oftentimes another scenario happens in the field where you kind of have these bundled predictors. So you have a lot of different things that could be causing the effect and you make hypotheses about them and their interactions um, because that's the nature of the data, right? So perhaps you wanna go a little deeper and you wanna isolate these. You wanna have a kind of a competition between them and see which one is stronger. Well, using a lab experiment could allow you to do that as well. Um, you wanna explore or understand a low frequency behavior. So in, in the field, you know, there's a lot of things that we're interested in that are low frequency, you know, unethical actions, behave, behaviors, cheating in line, but they don't happen all the time. You know, there's, there's difficulty in getting quality data with, with these types of variables. So you might consider a, a way to simulate this or replicate this in a lab study, some level of artificiality, but still a way to measure that, that outcome as well. And so this has been something that's been done a lot in psychology, you know, uh, behavioral economics as well. So you, there's a lot of existing paradigms that you could, you could couple onto and, and, uh, and work with there. You might wanna explore a practically or theoret re theoretically relevant context that has limited data or does not yet exist yet. So this is one that actually doesn't come up that often as to where a lab experiment can be, be very useful, but there's a lot of things that are happening in our changing world, right? That, that are happening today that are important uh, theoretically and practically for policymakers, for strategic managers. And if you wanna explore one of those potential hypothetical scenarios and see how it affects strategic management policy, uh, behaviors, perceptions, you could simulate some of this in the lab, okay? So of course it's removed a little bit from the real world, but you know, if you wanna think about things like how um, you know, sustainability or environmental shifts could impact policy or decisions, well, we can't wait necessarily for those environmental impacts to happen in order to collect the data to make that determination. So you could consider, um, uh, you know, a policy capturing study where you might you might get at some of this, um, and this could be impactful for other things that are changing theoretically too, such as kind of a shift toward, you know, the importance of the stakeholder or stakeholder theory in in strategy right now and trying to understand. Um, basically uh, how um, a stakeholder, how a third party might, might uh, observe, perceive, react to policy changes. So th those are things that you could, you could consider as well. Let's see. All right, um, so I've gone over that one as well. So a couple real quick things on design, I'll just scratch the surface here. So oftentimes when you're trying to get started, thinking about a lab experiment, people are, people are just asking like, how do, I, how do I do this? What do I do to get started, right? So, Key considerations that you have to think about are, you know, is there a task or an intervention 
that you could create. And this is a little bit of a creative process where you have to think about how do I simulate a scenario that could be a realistic scenario and I could put a, a manager in that, in that context or create an intervention. Um, so actually what, it, what happens is, you know, you think about the scenario, you probably test it, you iterate it. Sometimes I come up with these scenarios the first time on a long run, come back, write it down. It's a very iterative process. And what you're trying to do is find a way to simulate something that could happen in the real world, obviously simplified. Um, is it understandable? Does it have ecological validity? To understand this a little bit, you one of the things you could do is you could pilot test it with experts, you could pilot test it with other professors, and you could you, you basically are going to have to iterate this many, many times. So I don't know of too many scenarios where the experimenter came up with the the um, you know the, the the situation right off the bat. Um, so it's it's more of an iterative thing. The other thing that comes up are predictor variables. So usually you're considering either um, you're, you're going to randomize, but you're either going to use a vignette or a prime. And in strategy research, we've seen both of these be used. Uh, vignettes are more of like the storyboard of what you would read, maybe a news article, maybe you're reading about a best practice. So they're framing uh, a particular way of doing things, um, whereas a prime would be something where it's trying to change the way that a mindset is. So you're trying to randomize somebody into one of these, one of these uh, scenarios. Uh, outcome variables, there's two types. So intention-based or behavioral uh, measures. So one of the weaknesses with intention-based measures is you might say, well, you know, in the real world, nobody would actually, um, they might intend to do this, but they might not actually behave this way. So there's been a move in behavioral econ to work more behavioral measures where you actually try to measure the outcome. Um, so you know, this is something that isn't done too much in strategy and you know, is an is a opportunity for us to go forward. And uh, sample type. So one of the things to consider here is obviously, you know, a lot of the strategy questions are at the firm level. Um, so you, you know, replicating firm level decisions and the amount of firms you'd have to have in an experiment can be very difficult. So the question is, can you look at other, other levels of analysis to answer important questions that you might be studying? So you know, what about the, the idea of using uh, participants as proxies for firm decision makers, right? So, or using participants as proxies for stakeholders. So trying to understand how third-party stakeholders might have perceptions of policy changes and things like that. This is probably the core of where you're going to find most of your strategy experiments because it's a little bit easier to access the sample and uh, it's a little bit more realistic uh, as, as opposed to trying to, to uh, find firms that you can randomize conditions and treatments up into. However, th there are a few though that, that have done this. And if you go to the, the JOM review we have, you, there's um, information on each of these buckets as well. So I'm gonna skip over this slide, which is basically advantages and disadvantages because I'm sure this is gonna come up as we talk more uh, in, in the Q&A. But uh, just to leave you with a couple of final thoughts here. So in 39% of the experiments that we, we had in the, the JOM paper, those were used as a mixed method or a complementary um, methodology to an existing, an existing archival study, or perhaps a field study, uh, a, field, um, a field experiment. And I think this is a really great approach. This is pretty much the way that I go about um, you know, thinking about a lab experiment. I think about a lab experiment coupled with another study for most of the stuff that I go to publish with now. And I think this is a great way for strategy scholars to think about how we can grow this methodology with some of our existing work that we're doing. Uh, in terms of opportunities, so this just gives you a quick summary of where the studies were based on AOM uh, interest, interest group. So you can see that there hasn't been a lot of studies, for example, in strategic human capital, only five studies. That's an area where I think there's a huge opportunity because a lot of that has to do with, of course, strategic human capital decisions. And so some of that can be done by working with lower level um, third party observers or potential applicants and things like that. So this again, this again is in the, in, the, in the full paper. If you wanna dig into any one of these buckets, uh, all of the papers are identified. And the last thing is if you're really unsure how to get started here, we've also put together a little guide that's a, a three page document that kind of takes you through some of the decision points that I've identified today, sample, task, how to develop, you know, how to think about your primes and, and things like that. Um, you can find that through this, this link or through the paper itself. So I'll stop there and turn it over to the next panelist.
Thank you, Regan. Thank you for this, uh, this great introduction and an overview. And uh, now I'll ask uh, Giada and Stefano to, <clears throat> to, uh, to take us through the how. Thank you. Yes, so here I am. Thanks a lot for having me today. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, how, which is the part related to the implementation. And uh, again, as a background, I'm going to follow uh, Regan's um, um, example. So um, I'm a professor at Bocconi University and uh, um, I work definitely in what I would say is strategy. Um, we saw the IGs before, so I think uh, I consider myself someone at the intersection between SDR and team, let's say, so with an interest in innovation too. Um, and most of my research uses experiments. Uh, most of them are actually in the field. Uh, so I do a lot of what are called the lab in the field in which I use uh, field participants, but then I put them in somehow more simulated uh, situations in front of vignettes uh, using the terminology that we saw before. Um, but lately, I've also started to use uh, lab experiments, uh, mostly as a complement uh, to other studies. So what I'm going to focus on today uh, in my 20 minutes is to try and give you an overview of uh, different ways in which you can write a strategy paper using experiments. And then I'm going to focus a little bit more uh, on uh, how to use them as a complementary method. So considering a paper in which experiments are part of the things that you do. Um, I also have my own review piece uh, on the topic. Uh, I guess this is a feature that is common to the three panelists today. Um, this was published on uh, strategic organization uh, a couple of years ago, and it's joint work with Cedric Gutierrez, uh, who's uh, at Bocconi now. Um, and so what we basically find is also we saw this rise that Regan was talking about, uh, and we also see the problem that Regan was alluding to. So I'm disappointed to see that things have not changed uh, with five additional years of data, uh, because actually what we have is basically that at best, um, these uh, papers have represented 5% of the total uh, papers that have been published uh, in a journal uh, in one year, and this was SMJ in 2015. Um, so it's a trend, clearly, but it's a trend that is taking a little bit of time to, um, to take off. Um, so when we talk of uh, writing a paper using lab experiments, and there are different uh, approaches to do this. The one that uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, most of, of you are probably familiar with is the traditional uh, um, lab experiment paper, which consists of a number of studies uh, that follow uh, one um, the other and basically look at different facets of a phenomenon that you're studying. The, the clear example here would be a case in which you have multiple hypotheses and maybe use different experiments to test the different hypotheses, or you're looking at a phenomenon and you use the additional um, studies that follow the first to somehow uh, find uh, different angles to look at it, explore it more in details, uh, explore some moderators, uh, for instance, of the main uh, relationship you're interested in. This is typical in many fields, uh, including uh, psychology, uh, probably where this is, uh, the, I would say, the dominant uh, um, design. Uh, we do this in strategy too, and so there are um, multiple uh, uh, cases. And again, I think our panelists have examples of these in their portfolio of papers where you actually have papers that have multiple experiments, uh, one after, um, after the other. The issue, let's put it this way, the challenge uh, for those of, our, uh, of us who want to publish papers of this type is that it seems like the bar for what the number of studies uh, um, is uh, to be included in these papers is raise, uh, rising uh, uh, more and more. Uh, I was talking to a colleague the other day and she told me, oh yes, I have this paper with 11 experiments, but apparently this is not enough. And uh, um, I also have a paper under review in which we have five and one of the reviewers was saying the number of studies is still not sufficient. Um, so um, clearly there has been a trend in increasing the number because you know, once you know that you can replicate it in the lab and you can try a different variation, it's very easy to say, well, just try it and show me what happens. So to be handled with care. The second type would be um, another um, approach that I think you might have seen in the past, which is the one of using a field experiment and then coupling that with one or two usually lab experiments. 
This is also very common in strategy, I think, because of the fact that we are more used to carry field research. And so the idea basically here is to have uh, um, the field experiment to show that there is an effect in the field and to give you the external validity uh, to your study. And then uh, the lab studies uh, to somehow test the mechanisms uh, and try to look uh, uh, at the reasons uh, why you actually see this effect in the field and potentially replicate it in a way that is uh, cleaner in a context that you can control, which is the one of the lab. There is a little bit of an escalation here too with the end, but I think this escalation is somehow uh, tempered by the fact that uh, it is still considered that if you have a field experiment, this usually is a lot of work and it's not clean, it's not perfect by definition because it cannot be as controlled as in the lab, but still um, it should give you some sort of you know, advantage. And so people usually tend to be a little bit more lenient. The huge issue, however, that you have here is that you cannot easily replicate this. So if you get your resistance sign wrong, or if there are additional things that you want to explore, or if you realize that uh, um, the intervention that you designed that didn't work, uh, it's very costly to go back. So these are risky uh, in this sense. And then there are the less typical cases. Uh, the less typical cases are what I'm going to be focusing on today, um, which are cases in which you mix the lab experiment with other methods. And I'm going to somehow mention here the special issue that is forthcoming on uh, org science. Uh, Oliver, who's with us, is one of the was one of the editors on the issue, where one of the um, type of submissions that was explicitly uh, invited uh, was uh, uh, submissions that were bringing together different methods. So we're using experiments as the primary method, but then combining this uh, with different methods. And this is something that I really would like to underline. And this is something that uh, I'm very glad that Megan also pointed this out uh, before in his, uh, in his presenta presentation, because I think this is a very promising way to write a strategy paper using experiments. Why? Because, you know, experiments are intrinsically good uh, at many things. Uh, we have seen this already. They're very good when you want to assess causality, when you want to have a good construct validity, because you can directly measure what you're interested in. They're interesting uh, and very good if you want to develop an understanding of micro foundations, uh, mechanisms, uh, deconstruct, uh, macro level construct. But uh, as we argue with Cedric in our paper, they also honestly have some limitations uh, and we should just not kid uh, uh, each other about those because the limitations are clearly there. So it's very difficult to use experiments uh, to explain or let's say more difficult to explain organization level outcomes because the level of analysis usually tends to be very micro. This is not always true and we have examples uh, in the review that we did we actually find examples of papers that uh, explore constructs that usually we would think are at the organizational level. So in uh, our review with, uh, um, with Cedric, for instance, we discovered that a lot of these papers have to do with organizational phenomena, both at the level of processes and outcomes. And for instance, we're looking at you know, routines, uh, resources, uh, leadership decision-making. So you can think of using an experiment for this, even if uh, clearly it is more difficult to do so. And the second limitation comes from the fact that uh, it is uh, tricky to some extent uh, to generalize uh, uh, results outside of your context, uh, task, uh, participants. Now, to be honest with you, this is true for every method. But the reality of it is that uh, as an experimentalist, you're going to get a lot of pushback on this topic uh, from your reviewers and your editors. Uh, which is a little bit unfair, if I have to be honest, at least this is my perspective, but this is what happens in reality. So this only means that if you want to use this method, you have to become very good at trying to explain why picking uh, your particular population, your particular task, your particular context uh, is uh, the best thing that you could do in order to study the particular phenomenon you're interested in. Also, now, considering that there is this limitation, however, it should also be said that uh, you can act upon this particular aspect. For instance, you can change the context, move from the lab to the field, or you can change the task by making it more complex and replicating real-world situations. Think about what Regan was citing before with these uh, um, um, cases in which you actually have real firms that are involved uh, in, uh, in the experiments. And also participants can change, right? They can be students, 
And to be honest, we had endless discussions about this with Cedric, which comes from who comes from a decision uh, um, sciences background. Uh, and to him, like using students in the lab is perfectly fine uh, if you are interested in understanding uh, some decision making uh, that should be independent of the fact that you are actually talking to an executive uh, rather than a regular person, uh, just a random individual that you put in the lab. And so clearly you can change things here with the population. However, there are limits uh, and, and the limits are there. And it's clear that uh, no method is perfect, which uh, by the way, should not be a big news in the sense that no method is perfect by definition. So in the face of all these uh, potential limitations, uh, the recipe that I'm trying to leverage, that I'm going to give you an example of in a second, is that to use lab experiments as part of a broader portfolio of different studies that you can run and use in the same paper. So I'm going to use it as an example, and this was actually this is actually a paper that uh, has just been uh, published online. It's going to be part of this special issue. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of the background of what happened um, during the review process uh, to see how we grew the paper to become a paper that also incorporates a series of uh, two lab experiments. This is joint work with Maria Rita Micheli, who I think is in the audience. Um, and this is a paper in which, uh, briefly, um, very quickly uh, speaking, uh, we are um, we started to be interested in this idea of organization, basically protecting and governing the transfer of knowledge within and across their boundaries. So Maria Rita and I started to study CERN, uh, the nuclear uh, organization, the organization for nuclear research. And we basically discovered that within this organization, there were different, uh, um, let's call them um, experiments. This is how they are called in practice, uh, real organizations, which have, have a size of between 100 to 3000 physicists, who basically use the accelerator that was built in uh, Geneva to study physics of different type. And these different organizations that are there uh, study different type of physics, uh, are very different in size and the approach they use, except for two of them, ATLAS and CMS. You see them circled in the picture of the accelerator. And these two organizations, uh, we look at them and we started to realize that they were very peculiar in the sense that they were it looks like they were studying exactly the same type of physics uh, using the same kind of resource. The headquarters were co-located uh, and there were a lot of exchanges uh, in between them uh, on the one end. On the other, uh, the reason why they were created this way was because CERN wanted to somehow make sure that uh, it, the two organizations could replicate uh, their findings and somehow check on each other. Because as you can imagine, running this kind of experiment that they run in Switzerland is very expensive. There are few accelerators around the world. And so if you cannot replicate and make sure of the validity of scientific findings through another organization that is independent, separated, and can run the same type of studies, it is very difficult to actually make valid scientific claims. So we started to look at this context and we said, oh, this is very interesting and maybe it will give us a different context in which we can examine how organizations can make sure that they exchange a lot of knowledge inside. As you can imagine, if you are a scientist working in one of these groups, you want to be able to be connected and know a lot from your colleagues. But on the other end, organizations also need to put a strong barrier so that this knowledge doesn't leak outside of the organizational boundaries. Given that these two um, organizations were created to validate and check on each other, they need to be separated uh, and there needs to be no leakage of knowledge uh, from one to the other, because otherwise all this validity of the scientific process clearly would be compromised. But there you are, you have two organizations who are co-located, uh, who use the same key resource and are not supposed to talk to each other. So how do you accomplish that? How do you make sure that this happens? Now, as you can see, the way we started this project was uh, really on the field. And so what we did was basically, you know, do a lot of observations, uh, a lot of interviews uh, over multiple rounds. We started in 2016. By the time the call for the special issue came out in 2019, we had been already collected three years of data and we had run an experiment with physicists affiliated with CERN. 500 of them, which we basically put in front of a vignette that was simulating a number of variables we wanted to manipulate. And we had information from 
physics is affiliated with Atlas and physics is affiliated with CMS. And what we started to see was that uh, what really seemed to be different between these two organizations uh, was the climate uh, that the organization seemed to be characterized by. One of the two, Atlas, seemed to be very collaborative in nature. Uh, there was a lot of exchange inside the organization and clear rules that were impeding knowledge to go outside of the organizational boundaries. CMS, on the other hand, seemed to be super competitive. And what we found with the field study was that when asked, um, when put in front of a vignette that had a colleague from their own experiment versus a colleague from the other organization, uh, CMS employees would have rather leaked the knowledge outside the organization rather than pass it inside to their own colleagues. So a very different uh, knowledge sharing tendency. So we kind of had the sense that this had to do with the organizational climate. We submitted the paper and we submitted the paper saying, look, uh, we cannot really manipulate organizational climate in the field because these are real organizations. So we cannot go there and tell them now let's change your climate and make you feel like you are in competition with your colleagues if this is not what they're feeling. So we just said, you know what, we document the pattern, we show you through our interviews as well through some measures that we collected in the lab experiment that there is a difference in the way in which the, in the organization, so the climate of the organization looks like but we cannot make any causal claim. So we show you causally that there is a difference in the way in which these two organizations share. And then we give you some data about the fact uh, that we think that this is related uh, to the organizational climate. Uh, and we said this explicitly. And then of course, reviewer two came and said, yes, but you had to manipulate this in the field, which again, we know, as I told you, would have been kind of artificial and a little bit of difficult, difficult to do to convince these 500 physicists all in a sudden that their organizations had different traits compared to the real ones. So the editors came to us and said, look, guys, don't do this in the field. This would be impossible. What about you try and run a lab experiment in which you manipulate this and you see what the effect is. Now, to be honest, our reactions, I'm going to say my reaction, not to put Maria Rita here on the spot, under the spotlight was, uh, this is very complicated, right? So let's see uh, the kind of reaction we went through. The first reaction was, are you kidding us? Are you out of your mind? I mean, we spent three years collecting data at CERN with top physicists in the world, and we have this beautiful experiment done in the field. Yes, we cannot show that the mechanism is there, but like, look at this precious thing that we have, why do you want us to change it? So we talked and talked and we presented the paper multiple times and we kind of got over it. And we had a second phase and the second phase had this sort of like, as you can see, kind of evil phase in which we kind of agreed, okay, so fine, we are going to do this lab experiment, whatever, but we're going to put it in an online appendix. Nobody will ever see it. And the beauty of our paper is not going to be touched because we'll keep our treasures the way it was supposed to be. And then we did run the lab experiment. We added two additional phases of data, you know, additional interviews, 400 participants uh, in two experiments uh, on prolific because of course in all of these the pandemic was raging and so we could not bring people in the lab and uh, we actually started to reconsider our position about the fact that this experiment was doing something bad to our paper to be honest we kind of went to a third phase which was kind of like come on guys okay you were right we actually needed the, the lab experiment and I think this kind of transition, I mean, for, at least for me, is very common with all the revision processes I've gone through. At the beginning, you're kind of like, what are you talking about? And then you realize, mm, you know, maybe they've never improved as a result. Because what we noticed by doing this was that in making all these changes, we could actually claim that what our paper was doing was something that we think is very cool. And that is, we were actually going through two cycles uh, in which we were using more inductive methods, the interviews, the observation, to do theory building. To, to give you a sense, in the paper, we don't have hypotheses. We inductively build our observations from the field, and then we use first uh, the lab in the field study. So the field experiment to somehow find the confirmation of the patterns uh, that we have inductively uh, seen in the field. 
And then we start doing this all over again with another cycle of data collection in which we refine the theory through additional interviews, additional observations, presenting the results at CERN, et cetera. And the experiment comes at the end and says, well, now that we have provided you with all this evidence about the fact that we think the reason is the climate, let's actually go to the lab, get rid of everything else, recruit 400 people, and see whether if we can manipulate the climate that they feel working with a group, which in our case would be the organization, we can see that the learning, the sharing tendencies actually change. And we replicate the results in that case. So by adding this additional part, which we kind of felt was extraneous to the paper at the beginning, I think we actually go through this full cycle twice. And we believe the paper as a result is much stronger um, in the end. So we actually ended up making a claim that our paper is making an empirical contribution to which we were not expecting at the beginning, that is somehow to show how you can integrate qualitative data analysis with experimental data analysis, and how you can actually use experiments to study something that is very difficult to study in the lab. I mean, we have examples in the past, Weber and Camera is an example of management science, of people who are trying to manipulate the culture of an organization in the lab. And these always feel a little bit artificial, right? But I think by complementing the methods in this way, you can kind of get closer to somehow what we believe is the real phenomenon that is going on and the real effect that we were trying at. So I'm going to close on a positive note. I have to say there was a fourth phase in our journey with the paper, which is that of gratitude for the fact that actually something that we didn't think about at the beginning was forced on us, so let's put it this way. But in the end, I think uh, it actually contributed to make the paper much better. Thank you. Thank you, Jada. Thank you for the for sharing this experience with us. Thank you also for for ending on a positive note after telling us that you need six years of data to publish a, a lab lab based lab based uh, evidence uh, paper. But uh, but thank you very much. All right, and now for the for for um. For the do's and don'ts, uh, we're going to Oliver. Oliver, thank you. You're muted, sir. Okay, so thank you, Tomas, for the invitation and for organizing this fantastic webinar series on different types of empirical methods. My name is Oliver Schulke. I'm an associate professor of management and organizations at the University of Arizona. And before I get started, I need to be um, apologetic. There's going to be a lot of overlap with what the previous um, panelists were already talking about. That's probably kind of not a surprise. And um, the majority of things I would totally agree with. There are a few nuances of disagreement, and maybe um, we can get to that in the panel discussion. So that's always fun to, to see these uh, little differences. And I think they come a little bit from the three of us coming from different perspectives. Regan comes out of, we all strategy scholars, but he has a little bit of an entrepreneurship flavor to his research. Um, Jada, as she mentioned, she's um, at the interface of STR and TIM. I myself would position myself at the interface of STR and OMT. So my research is really uh, very much driven by theoretical questions. Um, and I guess that's where some of the nuance and differences and per, um, perspectives may come from. So um, like the two panelists before me, I'm very excited to talk about lab experiments, which are still, as I mentioned, pretty new to strategy research, at least as a mainstream method, right? And I was asked in particular to talk about the do's and don'ts associated with lab experiments. But before I get to that, let me tell you what my recommendations will be based on. So in other words, what are the data for my talk? So one sort of data, as Jada already mentioned, um, is going to be uh, my ongoing experience as a guest editor of an org science special issue on the topic of experiments in organization theory. We received more than 160 submissions and observing which of these papers fared well and which encountered problems during the review process was obviously very insightful. Um, so in addition to that, I've also had the opportunity to publish a number of articles using experimental methods, and many of them are still in the pipeline conducting, conducting this research, but perhaps more importantly, engaging with reviewers, as Shada's experience 
told you, um, taught me a thing or two about the ins and out of lab experiments. Further, I've co-authored a few papers specifically on experimental methods, which led me to dive into the relevant literature on lab experiments. And finally, I've been involved in organizing AOM PDWs on this very topic over the last nine years. It's amazing how fast time flies. I want to take this opportunity to invite you all to join us in the PDW this year or in future years. One of the most valuable aspects, I think, is that you can submit your work and paper or proposal in advance and then receive some in-depth feedback from the panelists who are really knowledgeable about experimental methods. Okay, so here is my very basic agenda for my talk. I essentially followed Tomasz's instructions and we'll start out with the strengths and limitations of lab experiments before getting to my suggestions surrounding do's and don'ts. In terms of strengths, the most well-known advantage of experiments has to do with their unique ability to establish causation. And I think there is little doubt that lab experiments are the gold standard when it comes to causality. This is the, because they employ a random assignment and afford high levels of control over potential confounds. I'm sure some of you must have felt like the character in this cartoon. I certainly did. Statistics classes tell us that correlations do not establish causation, but what do we do with this insight? Sure, there are sophisticated economic metric tricks to try to address this problem, but with non-experimental methods, the results will necessarily remain imperfect. So here are a few very concrete and practical things that you no longer have to worry about, at least as much, with lab experiments. If done right, you no longer need to include a laundry list of control variables in your regression model. Under most conditions, the independent variables and their interactions maybe will suffice. There's also no need to be concerned with instrumental variables and the such, which tend to dominate the review process of non-experimental papers these days. And finally, there's no need uh, to use weird language when phrasing the hypothesis. With experimental methods, it's not only okay, but actually much more appropriate to talk about causal effects and impacts. In addition, experiments are really useful for studying microfoundations. I'm sure some of you might have seen this diagram, most widely known as Coleman's bathtub or Coleman's boat. The key point is that strategy scholars can gain a lot of theoretical precision by studying how macro level effects can be explained by micro level processes and specifically how macro level sterling conditions like institutions affect the conditions of individual action, which in turn shape individual action, which ultimately aggregates up to macro level outcomes. And guess what? Experiments are really good at examining each of these micro foundational links. I think with the micro foundations movement gaining increasing traction in org theory and strategy, you'll also see more and more experimental research in these fields. Third and finally, experiments are really good at replication, which is increasingly being called for in strategy research. Compared to other methods, lab experiments make it relatively easy to create exactly the same design that other people have used in their research. Running these experimental replication studies is also comparatively easy and cheap. The emphasis here is on comparatively. Conducting a replication experiment appropriately still requires a lot of care and some money. Now, you might have heard about the replication crisis in experimental research, and I think this rumor needs to be put in perspective. Yes, there is, or there are quite a few experimental studies that it looks like cannot be replicated. But first off, we only know this because replication was possible in the first place, which is not the case for many other research methods. And secondly, a huge replication effort by Colin Kammerer and colleagues demonstrated that, and I quote, laboratory experiments are at least as robust and perhaps more robust than other kinds of empirical methods. And of course, like any other method, experiments have certain limitations and it's important to be aware of them. First, it's really tricky in a lab setting to test theory that assumes big firms with a long history. 
yes, you can have large groups and lengthy experiments with repeated sessions that are spread out over several months. But if your core interest is in providing empirical evidence specifically on large and old firms, lab experiments might not be your first go-to method. Second, good experiments are simple. That's at least what I choose to believe. Um, and I will get to back to that in my list of do's and don'ts. So if your theory calls for a fuzzy set approach with very complex configurations of a ton of different variables, experiments might again not be your first method of choice. Finally, and this is the most frequently mentioned limitation of lab experiments, there may be external validity concerns. By definition, lab experiments are conducted in the lab and not in the field. It cannot be taken for granted that findings from a lab experiment necessarily generalize to the field. I will get back to that in a little bit. So here's my list of do's and don'ts. Before I get started, let me emphasize that these recommendations are subjective and different people may have different opinions about some of these things, and that's okay. But it suggests that you need to understand how people assess certain things in your subfield. For instance, people who, have, who come out of econ might have very different standards than those that are grounded more in social psychology. So be aware that field-specific differences in standards exist and try to figure out what is being expected in a specific field that your research is addressing. Anyways, here are some of the things that I have seen work really well when it comes to experimental papers. First, use random assignment whenever you can. All the good things I said about the strength of lab experiments really only apply when you um, when you use random assignment. Yes, there are behavioral lab studies that only measure the IV, and that, and that might be necessary with certain variables, um, like personality traits. But just be aware that this means you're entering entirely different territory. Second, keep things simple. Well-designed experiments should be highly accessible, both to the participants and the readers of your work. If your subjects find it difficult to understand your instructions or if the reader can't figure out what exactly was going on in the study, that's not a good sign. Simplicity is also a virtue when it comes to the design of the study conditions. I'm personally a big fan of starting with a very simple one factor between subjects design with two study condition, just to establish a main effect first. Which brings me to the next point. Don't feel like you need to accomplish all the testing of your theory in a single study. Running more than one study not only allows you to increase complexity gradually, step by step, but also to provide evidence of convergent validity. That is, your results are not just a one-off, but are in fact robust to making certain changes to the study design. Fourth, we are now in a world where it has become the expectation that authors are highly transparent in their work. This includes posting a pre-registration before running a study and then making the materials, data, and log files publicly available on a platform like OSF. All of this ensures that there is no p-hacking and that other people can scrutinize the details of your procedures and can easily replicate what you've done. Next, I recommend investing considerable time and resources for pilot testing and a priori power analysis. The most convincing estimate for an effect size comes from a pilot study. And such estimates are the most important ingredient to a good power analysis, which again is the most important ingredient to your pre-registration. So make sure your pilots are done right and use exactly the same instruments as your main study, even if this means running um, several pilots. This is really the stage of the research process when it's absolutely okay to explore different things. So definitely take advantage of that. Six, uh, make sure you understand how to write up and report experimental studies. The method section follows quite different genre conventions than say archival research. 
Fortunately, it's not that difficult to figure out how to do it right. Simply download four or five experimental articles recently published in your target journal, and you will essentially have a template for what to do in your method section. Finally, do acknowledge limitations. As we heard before, no empirical method is perfect, and that includes lab experiments. So don't hide your limitations, but mention them proactively either in the introduction to the method section or in the discussion. On the other hand, there are a few things I recommend you avoid. First, as a reviewer, I have seen plenty of macro experiments that throw in control variables simply because your authors were used to doing that, but not because there was a good reason to do so. If you do use random assignment, that's what the little arrow here means, there's a good chance you don't need any control variables. If you do include some, you need to justify why you need them. Second, make sure you're not misaligning the level of your theory with the level of your empirical testing. Jada talked about that a little bit. For instance, I've seen papers that emphasize firms as their protagonists in the theoretical front end, but then use individual decision makers in the experiment with little empirical or organizational context being included in the experiment. Similarly, you generally should avoid talking about managers in the front end, but then use students for your testing. Now, the topic of student subjects could fill a seminar by itself, but my personal view is that students can be totally acceptable study participants, but less so when the experiments ask them to take on the role of the CEO of a Fortune 500 company and choose between a merger, a joint venture, and a contextual agreement. Further, and this is a very, um, this took a very patient AMJ reviewer before it's really sank in with me. Don't oversell your experiments managerial implications. Experiments are very good at testing theory, but less good at testing what is going on in a, for a particular type of firm. So it is only through theory that your experiment may inform managerial decision makers. And it's very important to be clear about that. Finally, and this may sound a bit counterintuitive, in most cases, don't try to be creative when it comes to experimental methods. Whenever possible, build on existing tasks and measures from psychology, sociology, econ, existing strategy research, doesn't matter. Not only will this help to save you a lot of time and ensure high degrees of validity, but it also fosters cumulative progress such that results across studies are much easier to compare. Um, these are my two cents on the do's and don'ts of lab experiments. And before I conclude, I would like to point to three readings that go in much greater depth in terms of recommendations for lab experimental research. The first is an edited book by Murray Webster and Jane Sell. The first edition of this book was my personal introduction to the world of lab experiments. And it gives a really good overview of the different aspects that require a researcher's attention. The second is a recent review article published by my colleague here at the University of Arizona, Nathan Potsikov and his dad. They give a very practical hands-on recommendation on how to improve one's chances of publishing experimental research and management. And finally, we've already seen it, I would like to point to my co-panelists, strategic organization piece, which is one of the very few sources, in addition to Regan's more recent paper, that specifically discusses experimental methods in the context of strategy research. So with that, I'm done, and I very much look forward to your questions that you might have for the panel. Thank you, Oliver, and again, thank you to all the panelists. So at, at this point in time, uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hand if you have, if you have some questions or comments. And uh, before uh, before you can do that, let me just follow up on a there's a there's a few questions somehow that seem to be recurrent from the from the chat. And Oliver, you you have very quickly addressed uh, addressed it just uh, just two minutes ago. But I wanted to follow up on that question to to all of the panelists about the participant pool, uh, right? And and in a sense, so there 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 are two questions actually. In that one is do you actually need to know who your participants are, right? So do you recruit them um, in person for the lab where you have a little, 
relatively more control on, on that as opposed to uh, to some of what seems to be more common is to using online platforms where sometimes you can control or put filters about who your participants will be uh, versus not. So in a sense, how important is knowing your participant pool and tailoring your participant pool to your uh, to your research uh, to your research question? And within that, some of the sub question is online versus in person. Uh, lab experiments. How do you think about that? How do you think about both some of the conclusions that we can draw, the strengths of 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 each of those ones, and publishability? Do you want us all to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, very very quickly. I know I know that, and you've said that we can cover another ninety minute uh, seminar on that. Uh, but uh, but so let's let's maybe start with online versus in person. I think that there's been less discussion about that. Yeah. Um, so so I how, do both, think, how do you both think? Both questions that? kind of go together, right? And for me, it really comes out of your theory. If your theory is all about CEOs or department heads or really these kind of very high level decision makers, and that's really an integral part of your theory. If you're, for example, anchoring yourself in upper echelon th theory, if that's a very prominent part of your front end, and that's a main point of your paper, I think it's extremely important to reflect that in the empirical part as well. There needs to be some consistency in terms of just the theoretical um, protagonists, the type of people you talk about in your theory and the type of people you use for experiments. And this then really guides your decision process, right? You first need to make sure, you need to make clear what kind of participants do I need? And then what is the best way to recruit them? Can I use a panel realistically to get at um, top decision makers? Yes, I know Qualtrics and others claim they are very good at targeting that, um, but it's your responsibility to make sure that this is actually true. So you might want to add some, even though there is a pre-screening, you might want to add some questions to your survey to actually ask participants about what they're doing. So it, yeah, as I said, like um, if you want these high level decision makers, maybe an online platform is more practical than inviting them to the lab, which is the logistics of that would be very difficult, but not impossible if you're teaching um, um, executive education classes, right? You can always exploit your students in these kind of classes to become um, subjects in your research. So um, that's one consideration. And that's the other consideration of offline and online is the type of task you plan on run running, right? There are certain tasks that can be totally done online. And we are getting better with implementing interactive platforms online such that it's possible to have these real-time interactions and online things. But if, for example, things like organizational climate is very important for your research where it's like really the group feel that needs to develop in a physical setting, um, then you might have to resort to a physical environment and that informs then also the, 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 the recruitment of participants. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. Shada, Regan. I think Regan, yeah. you are muted first, go. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, I agree with all of that. And just really quickly to add on, um, you know, originally I was doing a lot of in-person experiments and then that abruptly shifted to online. So some of that was driven by this, this um, you know, the situation that we've all come through. and we had to adapt a lot of procedures, but I think one of the advantages of being online is in particular when your decision context relates to online. So for example, if you're looking at how stakeholders respond to um, you, know, you know, corporate offerings or investors respond to equity crowdfunding situations, online can actually be a pretty good simulation for the actual decision context. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about that as, as being you know, a negative for having to do that. Uh, it definitely is important to know who your participant is. I think if you, you know, this is mirrors what Oliver said, but if you, if you um, have a research question and you set it up and then you throw it on MTurk or Prolific and you expect the reviewer or the reader to buy that that's a, a representative sample of what you're theorizing, I, I don't think it's going to work. Um, what you need to be thinking about sometimes is if this is a complementary methodology, can you can you look at a population that might not be your ideal uh, sample, but it could be close enough and it might be related to say a mechanism that is, that is theoretically applicable 
to a broader uh, assortment of individuals. Like for example, if your underlying mechanism in the decision context was prospect theory, and you wanted to understand how people respond to you know, a loss aversion type of scenario, you might be able to sell a, a, you know, a focused lab experiment on that particular aspect of the overall research question and then bring it back in context with a, with a field study um, with the, the core population of interest. So those are just some things to consider. Uh, you know, student samples, um, they can be appropriate, but it really is driven by the research question. So if the student sample resembles the population of interest, so this is probably an outsider, maybe somebody that's looking for a position, like a strategic HR type of question. Um, if the uh, if if experience might actually, there's there's an opportunity sometimes to go after students. If experience might actually confound what it is that you're trying to manipulate. So, for example, you know the experience of being a CEO for 15 years might actually confound with some variable that you're trying to manipulate that looks at self-efficacy or, or something to that effect. So you want to remove that experience context that could actually be a way you could sell the sample. Um, and then of course, grounded in a broader theory or grounded in like a larger human decision context, that's when, when that can work well for you. Okay, so I completely agree with everything that uh, Oliver Regan already said. Let me add on top of this a couple of considerations so first is related to the fact that there used to be, so historically there was a lot of pushback against online experiments. And I think I've seen this changing considerably over the years, where in like 10 years ago, you would have to have an entire section in which we're justifying the fact that you were using an online sample and explaining uh, why this was appropriate. And nowadays we have a number of studies that actually show that uh, to some extent, online samples are sometimes even better than the ones that you would get in your lab. Because if you think about it, I mean, if I run a study here in the lab, what kind of sample am I going to get? Students of Bocconi, are these our random participants outside, an average individual? I'm not sure. So um, if you go to an online platform, to some extent, you may actually have a higher level of generalizability of the findings. Again, depending on the type of question that you are investigating, which I think is the primary criterion. The second thing I wanted to add, it was related to the fact that some uh, um, processes, dynamics or questions uh, are very difficult to study online. So. Uh, for instance, with um, Cedric uh, Gutierrez, who I mentioned before, and Thorsten Grosjean near Bocconi, we are running a, a series of experiments on um, group formation, formation of groups. And as you can imagine, getting a group to form in an online setting uh, has some specificities that are very, make it very difficult and different compared to a case in which you would have people meeting in the lab for the first time and you would observe what happens when they actually get together and start working on stuff together. So in this case, I would definitely go for the lab. Indeed, our project had been on hold during the pandemic because we simply could not run the experiments in the lab. For other things like the organizational climate I was talking before. So I was lucky enough that I had a wonderful uh, um, precedence uh, to use. Uh, in particular, I built a lot on Oliver's uh, 2018 paper for uh, the protocol. Uh, now, Oliver was doing this in the lab. I had to adapt it to the uh, online setting. And so Maria Rita and I spent a considerable amount of time trying to somehow make sure that we were able, out of necessity, the pandemic, uh, to recreate uh, this ability for people to identify with the group of strangers uh, that they were going to work online, uh, work with online, where actually this was not even happening. So this whole group situation was simulated, had to be simulated because of the constraints, which meant that all our manipulations were extremely strong not subtle at all, let's put it this way. This is not ideal, but it was the only thing that we could do given the timing of you know, the revision of the paper in a special issue with the, the pandemic raging outside. So there may be conditions under which, I mean, if I had to run this study nowadays, I would probably want to do this in the uh, lab, in the physical lab. So you can play around some of the constraints. And I think, again, why is, this, is the online study acceptable in a context like this? It's because it's one of the studies that you have in the paper. If I had to write an entire paper on organizational climate based on interactions simulated online, I don't think this would go a long way. Um, on the other end, if you have a paper in which you already have the interviews, the lab in the field, you have collected all this data, and then 
cherry on top of the cake, you put also an online study, then it's perfectly um, reasonable. So I think it's also a matter of like the different pieces that are there in the paper and whether uh, um, you actually can somehow use the particular online setting uh, at your advantage uh, instead of like as the focus of the entire manuscript. Thank you. Um, so before uh, before giving giving it over to Vina, who has a who has a question, um, there were also um, there was also some there were also some questions about the norms of pre-registration, right? And then also we we thought it'd be very useful for the participants to uh, to hear from you and from your experience about what these norms are, and also if you if you don't mind also about whether you think that if you if you wish to speculate whether it's a norm that's going to spread over to uh, to other methods, we could very well imagine pre-registering when I'm buying archival data, right? There is no reason, in a sense, not to do it. Uh, and how do you think uh, somehow this uh, this potential um, uh, the, the, this potential norm uh, somehow going and potentially spreading to other 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 methods? You want me to start? So I think at this. At this stage, I would not take the risk of conducting an experiment without pre-registration because literally there is no reason I could think of not to do it. Um, the pre-registrations have a ton of advantages, like I was talking about. They make sure that <clears throat> you know you really only analyze what you knew in advance, and experiments by default, at least, are an inductive method. Um, it, it's for testing hypotheses and very rarely are they just for exploring the data. So there is this inherent fit between the idea of pre-registration and experimental methods. Now, what I would propose, pre-registrations have also a very practical advantage because I think you can make a strong case um, that you could even use one-tailed hypotheses testing methods. If you've pre-registered your hypothesis and have made very clear that it's a a one directional, a directional hypothesis, it's a positive or a negative effect, then it's entirely consistent to use one tail testing, which will give you a huge advantage in terms of sample size. So that's another practical reason for the researcher, him or herself, to use pre registration. What do you guys think? Okay, so I'll go first this time. Um, so pre-registration, yes, of course, pre-registration means uh, 3 million different things. There was one of the questions on the chat that asked, when do you pre-register? Do you pre-register before your pilots uh, or do you pre-register after the pilots? So I usually pre-register after the pilots uh, because what the, I use the pilots for is to, with a very small population of participants, uh, which doesn't allow me to pre-test, uh, what I'm actually going to test with the experiment. Um, so the, the pilot is not an experiment in disguise. It's like me making sure that uh, uh, nothing is wrong with my Qualtrics, uh, with my protocol, uh, that everything works, the participants understand that uh, there are no glitches uh, of any sort. And on top of that, I can check the duration of the study on which the compensation of participants is going to be based on. I can check uh, things like, uh, um, for instance, like the size of the effect, which is going to inform my power analysis and it's going to tell me how many participants I need to conduct the actual study with. Because of course I can infer this from prior paper, but no prior paper is going to have exactly what I'm interested in. So the pilot is very useful in that respect. So what I usually do is that I would have uh, all my documents ready, my protocol ready, everything ready. I would run the pilot, make small adjustments, and of course I would get ethical approval before running the pilot. Then I would run the pilot, make it, the adjustments, and based on that, then I would pre-register and run the final study. Also note, by the way, that when we talk about pre-registrations, a question that I also saw, there are multiple places where you can pre-register. Uh, a possibility is to do it on uh, OSF, uh, as Oliver was mentioning. This is where I usually do my pre-registrations, uh, but there are other places where you can go, like as predicted, for instance, or other places where you can go and pre-register your studies. Um, it doesn't really matter where you do it, uh, I think, uh, as long as you do it using one of these platforms. Now, the, um, 
what should be said uh, about pre-registration when I say it's, uh, it's a big topic and this again, I think other 90 minutes just on pre-registration is the fact that uh, first of all, when and what you pre-register makes a ton of difference. Try to go to one of these websites and look through applications. You will see that there are people like in our case, for instance, with Maria Rita, we pre-registered the level at which we were going to cluster the standard errors. That is, we had the precise plan of analysis in which we said that this is going to be the ID, this is the DV, these are the controls, this is how we measure this, we are going to run an OLS with the robust standard error cluster at the level of the participant, etc, etc, etc. Of course, an alternative way is you don't put all this information, it's not mandatory for you to put all the info. So there are degrees of what you can pre-register and clearly the more you leave it uh, up in the air, the more you have the flexibility to somehow change things uh, in the process. However, I think this is not a productive way to think about this. For me, a pre-registration is I'm making a contract with myself on what, why I'm running this experiment, what I want to see, what I'm going to look at. If in the process of analyzing the data, which is absolutely normal, I find something that is unexpected, that I didn't think about before, I want to explore, then I just report this as an exploratory analysis in the paper. It's a matter of how you write about these results. I'm not going to create a doc and hypothesis afterwards saying, oh, but I was actually also interested in. I'm just going to say this was what I wanted to test it in the process. I actually found out this thing. This is interesting. Maybe I can design another study if there's space for it. Or if not, I can just leave it to future research to explore it. So this is a broader issue about how we should be writing our papers. And I think it's an important conversation to have which by the way links uh, also to Tomasz's provocative question of whether this is just for experimentalists. My view, no. Uh, in the sense that we should be more and more demanding of this type of approach uh, from people who do all sorts of empirical research. My colleague here at Bocconi Sandip Pillai has a, a work in progress, a working paper with Brent Goldfarb and David Kirsch, in which they actually advocate for the use of pre-registration also for people using secondary data. And I strongly believe in this. Uh, we should not have a different standard of conduct just because it's supposedly easier to run an experiment. Maybe some of us are in universities where we can spend a thousand of euros or dollars every year running uh, random experiments to check whether we find effects until we get to exactly the right one. But in my case, with my research budget, I cannot run uh, five studies in order to get one of them working. So in a situation like this, I need to be very transparent. And I think these are constraints that are actually there for many uh, people. So it is important that uh, we also start considering experiments as to some extent also an expensive tool of research. It really depends on how you want to contact them, how many participants you want to have, how long is your study, how complex it is. There is a lot of variance there. Regan. Very thorough. So just a really quick thing, a couple things to add. I agree with everything the panelists have said. Um, you know, there's a real advantage to thinking about pre-registration, especially if you're new to the, to the process or working with a doctoral student, because it really forces you to practically think through each, each uh, potential variable. Um, the other thing that was alluded to by, by Giada is the fact that, you, you know, there's oftentimes things that you'll discover along the process. As an experimentalist, somebody that's has run a lot of experiments. There's a lot of times where early on, um, you know, the experiments don't pan out the way you thought. So it's really important to think about pretests, to think about pilot tests that are lower cost that you can use to try to understand the context more. And in those types of scenarios, uh, before you go to do your formal study, you might ask different types of questions like qualitative open-ended questions where you're trying to understand what it is that, that the uh, participants are, are experiencing cognitively or emotionally. And those don't have quantifiable um, variables that you would attach to necessarily, but you get a, you get a feel for what, it, what, could, what you could study as you formalize the, the research um, and spend a lot of time thinking through pilots and, and pretests. When you do pretests, I saw this question kind of come up as well. You don't, I don't necessarily look for statistical significance. I look for uh, relationships that are trending in the right way, smaller sample sizes. These are things that you know may not end up being reported, but it's just helping me think through research questions. Um, and, and I use a lot of open-ended qualitative questions. And this is an area where actually I, I like to use in-person designs where I would bring people into the lab and I would have conversations with them after 
after as part of the pretest. And this, a lot of this would take place, uh, as Giada said, potentially before you would pre-register, because this is still when you're exploring what your research question might be. So uh, it can be kind of a long process, um, but uh, you know, a lot of times you'll see multiple experiments in a paper and and and, uh, and paper and experiments that might lead to those uh, from from previous work. And the last thing I'll say about this is, um, I really hope it's an opportunity as pre-registration becomes more common for us to publish more papers that have you know no no findings or or, or, or no findings, because I, I personally want to know more about this <laughs> as somebody that's had papers go that way um, and and of course not been able to publish them. Th this is this is something that I think that we we need to do more of. Thank you very much, uh, Bina. I'll, uh, I'll I'll give you I'll give you the floor. You had a question from what I understood about the some of designing uh, designing experiments for for the study of of dynamics of behavior. Is that correct? Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for this session. It's been really informative and uh, interesting as well to hear uh, the perspectives. Um, my question is related to uh, more of. So I'll try and take an example. Let's say I'm running a study where I have a vignette and I have my participants experience certain emotions and they fill out a scale, they talk about how they're feeling and then I want them to interact with other people. So with other people over a course of maybe a few hours or maybe an hour uh, within like so I collect the data the first time and then I let them interact with other people and I want to see if there's a change in how they feel based on that interaction so that's what I was talking about so if there's like a time gap in between the first data collection and the second stage of the data collection and something is happening in between the two time gaps what additional considerations um, come into play in that case that um, I should be aware of as I'm designing something like that. I I hope that that's uh, more clear than my write up over there on the chat. Regan, Chad, do you have experience with longitudinal lab experiments? I don't. It sounds like a complicated design, um, which is neither good nor bad in itself, but it's definitely good that you're thinking about this complication in advance. Vegan, do you have? Yeah, I have some experience. Um, the design that you described could be complicated because of all of the potential interactions that are taking place that you don't have full control over. So one thing you might consider in that scenario, if you wanna do this multi-study design is, I mean, people have used uh, kind of more informants um, in, in the role, playing the role of the participant, whether that be through a simulation online or even in a, a live interaction. So that's one potential where you could get greater control so that the, the persons, that the, the people that are interacting actually have kind of more of a standardized script, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's one potential. Um, the other thing is you might consider, like the idea of, of multiple time points, I think is, is, a, is a really good consideration for a lot of reasons, right? So there might be certain variables that you want to prime first, then capture what you believe to be a theoretical mediation variable at one point in time, and then capture a, a DV at a, at a later point in time. So setting it up this way could be really advantageous in terms of the way you write up the paper to explain, you know, the causal, the flow um, between these variables. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it sounds, it's, it's, it's a, could be a tricky design that what you're describing. So let me ask you this. Do you already expect differences across conditions in the first measurement before their interactions or only in the post interaction measurement? Both, actually. Both. Okay. Both. Because yeah. what I've seen a lot uh, done inappropriately is the post design where there was really no difference previously. So then it's really sufficient to only focus on what you measure at the end. But if, if there is really a, a complicated interaction on pre and post, yeah. um, you, you have to use the methodologies that you also see for, you know, survey based longitudinal design where you have the, ne the nested nature of the data definitely considered mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the cross temporal effects also kind of modeled in your design. Mm -hmm. So do control variables start to play a bigger role in this kind of a study given the given that there's actually a little bit of like a time gap and so 
not everything is completely controlled and maybe even if I have random assignment. Again, only if you have actual reason to believe that one, there, there could be like really fundamentally different dynamics happening in one than in the other condition. And these dynamics mm -hmm. are not part of your theory and you want to rule them out or account for. If that's what you expect, then yes, control variables could be important only then. And then you would have to have a priori theory about what these confounding processes are. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, does anyone have any other question or comment? Please feel free again to, uh, to jump in, raise your virtual hand. If if not, then I, I still want to take advantage of the of the three minutes. So you're you're not getting off that easily. So so can, could we go back very quickly to the external validity question, right? And I know that this 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 potentially is a nightmare for an experimentalist, uh, but there are, my understanding is that there are potentially two issues, right? One to that we already mentioned about the are we asking the right person. The second one is, are the causal relationships that we establish in the lab actually likely to happen and to some to, to, uh, to be maintained outside of the lab, right? And, uh, and we also know that there's been uh, quite a raging discussion about would the, somehow would the, the extent and magnitude of, for example, pro-social preferences uh, that is documented in the lab uh, what we actually see in the field is potentially just a fraction of that. How do you think about these types of questions for external validity? And, uh, and what's the, or in a sense, that's for an experimentalist to say, well, it's for someone else to go and test it in the field. Uh, we're, giving you, we're giving you what we see in the lab. Okay, so my take, first, it's a matter of how you report your results. No paper can accomplish everything and show an effect under all the conditions. So it's very important, going back to how we write the papers, it's very important that we write papers in a way that is close to what we have, close to what we found. We are explicit about saying that on our population, in this particular instance, given this context task, etc., this is what we find. We can push this in the discussion and say this is suggestive over more general, you know, um, relationship, but I would be very cautious in what I claim to be doing in every single paper. This is uh, not the way in which we have been, most of us have been taught to be writing papers because we tend to write this you know, papers in which we have these amazing introductions in which we say we are going to solve all the problems of the world uh, with the single study, but the reality is that this is not doable, this is not what we do, and this is not an issue only with experiment. So in general, uh, this would be my first uh, word of caution, that is, uh, report the results for what they are. The second, um, the second, I think, if you want, uh, perspective that I have on this, I'm going to reiterate it, uh, is uh, use the lab experiment as one of the things that you have in the paper, which may mean complemented with other lab studies uh, that somehow, again, are going to, in the fashion that Oliver was describing, which, you know, you start from something simple and you start adding, and in this way, you can somehow uh, uh, increase uh, the validity of the study, or just have uh, in the spirit of consilience, what I was talking about before, if our ultimate goal as researcher is that to find out what is actually going out there, it's important that we try to get uh, there in different ways. A lab experiment or a series of lab experiments is a way, and maybe a paper, this is what a paper does, but we can try even within the same paper to get there in different ways the interviews, the qualitative data, the study in the field, uh, a survey. Uh, there are uh, ex many examples of papers, uh, um, one by um, um, Caroline Flammer and uh, Olenka Kaspersky come to mind in SMJ, in which they use uh, three different types of uh, data sources, including a lab experiment, to somehow try and say all of this evidence converges towards this finding. Uh, uh, which makes us a little bit more confident in saying uh, that maybe this is what is going on. But again, how we report stuff, this is the most important thing. 
So I'll agree with that really quickly. Um, the convergence, using it as a complementary methodology with other field studies is a tactic that I think all, all of us shared as, as, as uh, the way that we move forward. And then spending a lot of time up front thinking about the design. And this relates to some of the other questions about pilots and pretest. Sometimes the, that time is spent with a very, very small number of people. You know, it might be four or five other professors that are experts in the area, or maybe four or five entrepreneurs that, that I can talk to about the decision context and, and thinking about how they see it. it. Does it seem realistic? What do you, what do you find here that's, that uh, would throw you off if you were in this situation? And so, um, and then writing all that up and reporting all of that in the paper as, as justification as to why it, it represents the realistic context is something that I, I spend a lot of time doing. And I, I, it makes me feel much more confident about spending money on the full data collection when the time, time is right as well. Okay, yeah, so in addition to what Regan just said, like measuring the level of realism, two other things you can do to address this as an experimentalist are first to try to create an experimental setting that is incentive compatible in many ways, such that you know the incentives for the participant in the study are very much like those of you know, real world decision makers. Because if that is the case, then things like social desirability bias might be less pronounced, uh, more, less of an issue for the experiment. The second thing um, that you need to be aware of are demand characteristics, right? Um, the possibility that the participants kind of figure out what the research is about and they wanna be nice and play along. So that's something you gotta have on your radar because it can produce artificial results that don't mean anything. And um, to do that, you also need to probe for suspicion and kind of, yes, you uh, experimental manipulation should be kind of strong and, and very um, not subtle, but at the same time, you also gotta make sure that the participants does not really figure out right away what the hypothesis is. And you can test for that with some suspicion checks or debriefing questions. So yeah, there are some a few few concrete things you can do to alleviate these kinds of biases that would um, you know, inform this external validity concern that Tomas mentioned. Right, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, we are out of time. So again, thank you uh, to all the panelists. Thank you, Heather, uh, for spearheading it. And thank you all the participants for, for being with us. Um, and uh, hopefully it was useful and, uh, and you're going to use it. And we're going to see a growing uh, population of experimentalists in the field of strategic management. And then we're on the Bifindis. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Tomas, exactly. for inviting us. On I think I speak on behalf of all the panelists for and the participants for organizing the session. Thank you. Thank you, Tomas. Thank you.